Hello and let's talk about Facebook and its relationship with the BJP. A few days ago, the Wall Street Journal published a report which said that the social media giant had not taken action against BJP legislator D. Raja Singh, despite his posts falling foul of the company's standards regarding hate speech. According to Facebook insiders, Aki Das, the head of policy for the region, had a say in this decision, which was taken to make sure that business would not be affected. The report also listed other instances of BJP leaders' content being untouched and other pro-BJP decisions by the company. This raises a lot of questions about Facebook's relationship with the ruling party and its long-term implications for our democracy. We talked to senior journalist Paranjay Guha Thakurta on some of these issues. So Paranjay, the standard argument given by Facebook on when any of these questions is raised in any country of the world is that we agree that there are a lot has to be done and that we agree that much more you know, but like you said, these are algorithms. We are trying, the extent of the problem is too great. We are trying to, you know, solve it. If things are brought to our notice, we try to take it down. So there's this bevy of standard responses, which gives the impression of a company which is desperately trying, but failing to control the problem of hate. So does the experience in India bear out this argument? Or just Absolutely this argument? correct. Yeah. You see, faced with pressure from different parts of the world, from Australia, from New Zealand, from Germany, from France, from other parts of the world, Facebook was, had to set up what they called an external oversight committee, comprising a, a big team of eminent public figures who are supposed to have the power to even overrule what Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg, the two, uh, the top two individuals in Facebook, what they, uh, their, even their decisions. Now, so far, we haven't seen these, uh, the, the, the committee having as far as India is concerned, we haven't seen any intervention from that committee. Now, this argument that yeah, this is our technology. Let's take an example from India. Some years ago in Rajasthan's Raj Samand district, a person killed another person who was a Muslim laborer and, and the so-called love jihad. He was allegedly you know, trying to entice a, a Hindu woman the story is that this killing, this gruesome act was videographed by a relative of this man. But Facebook threw its hands up and said, we can't do anything about it. Our end-to-end -end encryption technology, we don't know who's put it up. We don't know who, is, who it's gone to. Now, this is really uh, the problem. You are refusing to be accountable. Even the present government, even Mr. Narendra Modi's government, Ravi Shankar Prasad more than once has said, look, what if there are heinous crimes? What if there's a murder, a rape, and there's evidence on WhatsApp? Now, the courts of India are actually using evidence on, uh, that's come on WhatsApp. But that means you actually have to seize a person's phone and, and then get access to all the WhatsApp messages. WhatsApp itself is not going to oblige you. The, the last point is, you know, this whole thing about we'll take care about his speech. We have machines, there's machine learning, there's algorithms. I mean, a lot of it is a, just a lot of hogwash. I mean, these algorithms are designed by human beings. So I'm saying to expect those machines, to expect those algorithms to take care of each speech is, in my opinion, completely unrealistic. Now, what we are seeing is the giant behemoth. This is one of the largest corporate conglomerates on the planet. And, and it, despite all the criticism, it is desperately struggling to you know, invoke provisions of free speech, privacy to keep going. I mean, recently, uh, you will be aware that uh, a, a number of giant uh, corporations, including Coca-Cola and Ford, actually withdrew advertising from uh, uh, Facebook. I mean, they, they tried to hit where it would hurt. Absolutely. But Facebook seems to be trying to brazen it out. What we are clearly seeing is that the views of people like Mizaki Das and Shivnath Sakral prevails, even when uh, within the same organization, there is opposition or, or, or there are complaints that the kind of content that has been put out is it's against the company's roots. Yeah, it, it's not as inappropriate. Exactly. I mean, look in India, Prashant, there have been dozens of mob lynchings. There have been Hindu Muslim riots. There have been public, you know, you know, lack of order, public disorder, if you like. And at the behind all of these incidents and episodes, you have WhatsApp messages. Absolutely. Right. Karanja, in this context, one aspect 
uh, the article points out, of course, but also something you have been working on quite extensively is the fact that Facebook has giant commercial plans in India. Now, there is, of course, the investment in uh, Reliance that we've seen. There's a WhatsApp payment uh, option that has been pending for quite some time. So could you take us a bit through what so far we've uncovered of what Facebook's grand plans for India also are? As in, why is this an important market? That's correct. You know, for some years now, Facebook had been lobbying to get its payments mechanisms going because that's one way WhatsApp can make money. Now, uh, the Reserve Bank of India took its time, but uh, the argument was really about data localization because after Google Play came into the act, they have uh, um, uh, the, the WhatsApp uh, mechanism has uh, payments mechanism is, is, has come through. But the point is here you have a giant international monopoly, a conglomerate, which is tying up with an Indian conglomerate headed by India's richest man, Mr. Mukesh Ambani, who is also Asia's richest man and among the world's most uh, wealthy individuals. And you have a domestic big wig in the form of Reliance Geo, which was nowhere in the picture four years ago and today has the highest number of subscribers. It's the biggest telecommunications and mobile internet data services provider. And now at a time when the economy is in a mess, you know, uh, there, there's been a complete collapse in economic activity. There's been widespread hunger, deprivation, and, and, and all kinds of terrible things that have been happening. Here you see Facebook investing billions of dollars in Reliance Geo. So we have a classic case of an international monopoly and a domestic monopoly coming together. And, and what its impact would be for in India on Indian politics, on free speech, on the way uh, different kinds of content is distributed and disseminated, what at the end of the day you, you get to read and you get to hear and you get to watch, all of this would have, in my opinion, a profound impact, just as the Wall Street Journal has flagged the impact on politics when you have the top brass of Facebook in India in very close proximity to the ruling dispensation, what we might end up seeing are, are bigger challenges and bigger issues. Absolutely. And in this context, uh, finally, so what we do have is, of course, like you exactly pointed out, the the company itself having a decisive impact on Indian politics. And this happens, of course, both the actions of individuals who make these decisions, but also in, in terms of how the product itself has seeped so much into our lives, whether it be Facebook, whether it be Instagram, whether it be WhatsApp. And so then the question of what is a democracy, what is your politics, all this is inextricably connected with these products. So in this context, based on global examples, what do you see as any kind of way forward, uh, at least in an ideal situation, whether this government is interested in implementing it is a different question. But what are the possibilities that lie ahead? Okay, now, uh, before I answer your question, let me give you one very prominent, egregious example of how WhatsApp has been used in India. And, and let me give you the example from uh, the 22nd of December, 2018, when Amit Shah, who was then the president of the Bharti Janta Party, who's today India's home minister, he was speaking at a public rally for social media volunteers of the BJP at Kota in Rajasthan. Now, now he remarked, we are capable of delivering any message we want to the public, whether sweet or sour, true or fake. Now, he, he is the second most powerful person in the, in the country at present. He's the home minister of the country. You know, uh, this issue has been raised in, in, in the Rajya Sabha in Parliament. Now, let's contextualize what he said. Before the Uttar Pradesh elections took place in February, March 2017, this was India's most popular state, the BJP had set up huge groups of WhatsApp supporters. And, and, and the total was about 3.2 million, 32 lakhs. And... The, the, the really ironical part about the whole thing is that, you know, uh, it was supposed to tell BJP volunteers about the truth and about false information. Now, one particular person had put out a bit of fake information that the then chief minister, Akhilesh Yadav, had slapped his father 
Mulan Singh Yadav. It was completely fake, but that whole, the, the, the whole uh, WhatsApp message went viral. And this is what Mr. Amit Shah had to say. So, you know, he, he said uh, an environment, a mohal had been created. As members of the audience smirked, and I'm sure uh, Mr. Amit Shah's tongue was firmly in his cheek when he almost lovingly chided them and said, this is something worth doing, but don't do it. You understand what I'm saying? So this is the sheer power of how WhatsApp has been used and misused for political purposes. Right. Ravish Kumar, the NDTV India anchor, has famously uh, remarked that there's a huge number of people in India who haven't had the, the privilege of getting quality education in an educational institution. They are growing up in WhatsApp University. Let me give you a personal example. A, a young a relative of mine came one day and he said, you know, not all Muslims are terrorists, but all terrorists are Muslim. And I said, How, who, who told you this? He said, WhatsApp. So this is the way it spreads. Coming to your, your point about can you control? How do you control? In the US, they've been struggling. Elizabeth Warren, uh, a legislator of the Democratic Party, she actually argued that you should break Facebook up and Google up. Actually fragment these by law, break up these monopolies uh, in the way uh, AT&T, American Telephone and Tele Telegraph, the uh, the, the uh, company set up by Alexander Graham Bell had been broken up. The way Standard Oil, SO, had been broken up. Whether that will happen, I'm not at all sure. It certainly won't happen under a Trump administration, but we'll have to wait and watch. Within India, too, the regulatory mechanisms are inadequate. And, and there is always this counter-argument, free speech, freedom of expression, technical, uh, you know, this whole... Uh, that what Secrecy of algorithms. Yes, yes, yes. You take shelter behind uh, your ideas of privacy and, and, and free speech uh, to just be able to earn more and more money. At the end of the day, a lot of people don't realize, oh, Facebook, we're able to connect with our good friends, we're able to share our pictures, we're able to meet long lost uh, whatever schoolmates. But you don't realize the other side of the coin. That you, your behavior is being closely tracked you are being followed and your behavior is being sold for Facebook to earn profits. After all, it's a private company. It wants to maximize its profits. But the dangers it poses to society, to political, uh, to, to, to what's happening in, uh, in the country, to politics in this country, are really very, very important. And then this is true for many other countries in the world. And after the Wall Street Journal article, certainly, true for India. Thank you so much, Paranjya, for talking to us. My pleasure. In our next segment, we look at a common concern many of us have regarding COVID-19, that of reinfections. There's been a lot of speculation and debate over whether those who have already contracted the disease once may do so again. How likely is this to happen? We bring you a segment of a conversation between News Clicks Prabir Purkayasta and immunologist Dr. Satyajit Rath. Coming to the question of reinfections, there are also some examples you've been talked about where reinfections is said to have occurred. Now, in the very large number of cases which are there in the world today, and we have the total number is really very large, number of reinfections of this kind reported are really, you can count on the fingers of our hands. So effectively, it seems a rare, a rare occurrence. But could you explain that the chances of reinfection, or at least within five, six months, is why it is so rare and this is likely to be only an outlier? So there are... This is, a, this is going to be a very unsatisfactory answer um, because it's essentially going to say that in none of the cases of reinfection that have been anecdotally described, do we actually know that it's reinfection? And here's why we don't know. How do we know that there's infection? Because you test the fluid and you find virus, viral RNA. Let's not even worry about whether that's whole infectious virus or not. You find viral RNA. You test 15 days later, you find. Then you test 15 days later, you don't find. Then a month later, you test, you find. Now, is this reinfection or is it just that one of these tests was just technically mm, not right and missed finding the viral RNA? Most of the reinfection stories we hear fall in this category. 
and therefore in most of them it's at the moment impossible to distinguish between the possibility that it's an infection and the possibility that these people are that very small and interesting and important minority who clear virus very 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 slow the cases have been up to 9 months that the virus stays in the That's body That's absolutely right. So therefore it's a, it's more likely to be that kind of an outlier than a reinfection outlier. It's certainly as likely to be that as this. Okay. okay. So both hypotheses stay and at so, the moment it's difficult to say which is which. And 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 since um, we've been saying that this is as much about the substance of science as about the politics of science and society let me um, take a moment to explain how we would differentiate between the possibility that this is simply a continuing infection versus that it's a reinfection so if you had the entire viral rna sequenced then between two samples if there was sequence continuity it's the same virus but if the second sample is clearly different in sequence from the first sample because you acquired it from somebody else in whom the virus has changed in the meanwhile differently then you have true reinfection so the way to ask the question to people who talk about reinfection is are there viral sequencing data from before the negative test and after the negative test much more difficult to much more difficult much more difficult coming to the other issue which of course is hanging in the background of all this is the efficacy of the vaccine that how long will it be assuming the vaccine is successful and we have enough number of cases for us at least to sound optimistic at this stage assuming one or two or more of the vaccines will become effective the question remains for how long now does it mean that after three months they won't be effective that after six months they won't be effective or the what is a likelihood using your crystal ball as a uh, immune system expert what would be the crystal ball that you would consult and what would it say so prabir i am enjoying myself today because this is my second one of sounding optimistic and after a very long time of It not telling our viewers that this is not a usual occurrence that we get him optimistic twice in a show i mean one itself is a big thing quite something is for sorry for the interruption so um so here's the issue when you have a virus infection we have an immune response absolutely but the virus has gotten selected in a sort of mutual evolution where the virus that is infecting us successfully has figured out at least a little bit of how to deal with immunity simply because a virus strain that cannot deal well with immunity will get propagated poorly so a viral variant that deals somehow with immunity will be preferentially propagated and in proper darwinian evolution that's the strain that will come to dominate now if that's the case then the likelihood is that sars cov 2 has ways of fiddling with the immune response but sars cov 2 is not what we are putting into the vaccine remember we've been discussing a variety of vaccine uh, design technologies in all of which we take one protein of sars cov 2 and simply get the body to see the protein and to make an immune response against it we don't put a live sars cov 2 virus into the body as a vaccine so none of the tricks that sars cov 2 is using to fiddle with the immune response are included in the vaccine so the fact that sars cov 2 infection may lead to short lived immunity is not telling us that the vaccines that we are designing will also necessarily leave, lead to short lived immunity now 
the vaccine technologies may have their own limitations because of which some uh, anti-vaccine responses will last less uh, long than other anti-vaccine responses. But the fact that SARS-CoV-2 antibody responses may not be long-lived is no uh, pessimistic guarantee that vaccine responses are going to be shortly. For all we know, vaccine responses will be respectively made. That optimistic point made, let me add a pessimistic footnote, which is that my expectation is that the first generation vaccines which will come up, as we've been discussing, by the end of this year, my guess is that they will not be great vaccines. They will, they will work, they will be useful, but they will, they will not provide 100% protection, but they'll provide some protection. They'll not be very long-lived, but they'll be reasonably long-lived. But that's not going to be because SARS-CoV-2 is short-lived immune. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with more news developments from the country. Until then, keep watching NewsClick.